Hello, I'm John Burland. I'm based here at Imperial College. And for most of my life, I have worked as a geotechnical engineer. My work has taken me to many parts of the world and I've been involved in hundreds of fascinating and interesting projects. Perhaps the most famous one that I was privileged to work on was the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And my job there was to stop it from falling over. Now, as we know, civil engineering is all about providing and maintaining the infrastructure that makes civilization possible. And by infrastructure, I mean roads, railways, canals, tunnels, dams, airports, bridges. So really geotechnical engineering is a specialization of civil engineering. Now all this civil engineering infrastructure has to rest on the ground. And the next time you're in a tunnel and wondering why it's not falling in, or in a large building and wondering why it's not sinking into the ground, give thanks to a geotechnical engineer who may be long forgotten now because it was his responsibility for making sure that those structures are safe. Soil mechanics is that branch of science that studies the mechanical behaviour of soils as they apply to the design of civil engineering structures. I'm often struck by the intimate knowledge that a craftsman has of the materials that they have to work with. As geotechnical engineers, the principal material that we are working with is the soil. And a good geotechnical engineer requires an intimate knowledge of how the soil behaves. This series of videos is intended to help geotechnical engineers really understand their material, soil. Soil is a very complex material and one of the big challenges facing a geotechnical engineer is how do you predict its behaviour when you're designing a tunnel, a foundation for a skyscraper, a deep excavation, a dam. What I want to show you in this brief video is that soil is made up of individual particles. This single fact is absolutely crucial to understanding its behaviour. Now I've got some examples of different types of soil here. Gravel, obviously made up of particles. Sand, obviously made of particles too. Silt, which you find at the bottom of lakes, is made of particles but you need a magnifying glass to see them, and clay. Now this is stiff, but if you dry it out, it looks like this. And if you look at the dried out clay under an electron microscope, you will see that it is also made of particles. The first thing we need to consider is how a material made up of individual particles can resist load. Now here we have a model soil made up of circular disks to represent the particles. Now if I push on one side of this stack of particles, we see that they slide past one another. So to conclude, in this video we have learned that soil is made up of particles and that a soil's ability to resist loads is generated by shearing resistance at the particle contacts. We saw in the last video that soil is made up of a number of individual particles. Many soils are formed when soil particles suspended in water are deposited in rivers and lakes. The first thing I want to explore is how this deposition under gravity affects how soils behave. I have developed this piece of apparatus 
that simulates the effects of gravity. The particles here are circular disks of different diameters and they are resting on a plastic sheet which is drawn across the bottom here by means of this roller. When I turn on the machine, the plastic sheet drags the particles to the bottom in the same way that gravity drags soil particles to the bottom of a river or a lake. In real life, gravity gives the soil particles weight, pulling them downwards. In this model, weight is simulated by the friction between the soil particles and the moving plastic sheet. And you can see that they're settling on the bottom and they're now shuffling around and forming themselves into an arrangement of particles. You can see these near vertical columns and they're very important because it means the soil is stronger in the vertical direction than the horizontal direction. And that's because this has been deposited under gravity. Gravity acts vertically. A soil deposit laid down under gravity is stronger vertically than it is horizontally. Now we're going to look at another very important effect of gravity. We're going to see how it affects the strength of the soil at different depths. So we'll do an experiment with a footing. Here it goes. You can see it penetrating in. And it's reached this depth here. Uh, so the weight of the footing is being carried by the strength of the soil at this depth. Now we're going to increase the weight of the footing and see what happens to the penetration. And we see the footing now penetrating further into the ground. Let's see how far it goes into the ground with four batteries acting on it. There it is, it's come to equilibrium, actually at a greater depth than the lightly loaded footing. So why is this? Why is the strength of the soil greater with depth? You'll know from your mechanics classes that the shearing forces or frictional resistance between two surfaces depends on the magnitude of the contact forces that are pushing the two surfaces together. When the contact forces are small, the shearing forces or frictional resistance is low and they can slip past each other. When the contact forces increase, the shearing forces or frictional resistance goes up and it is much harder for the two surfaces to slip past each other. Now, going back to our experiment, gravity acts, the soil has weight, the deeper you go down, the greater the forces between the particles. So the greater the shearing resistance between the particles. And that's the explanation for the strength increasing with depth. So, summing up, we have seen that the soil is stronger vertically than it is horizontally. And we have seen that the strength of the soil increases with depth. Both these very important effects result from the soil being laid down and acted on by gravity. A factor of great importance to the strength of the soil is the range of particle sizes that are contained within it. We talk about a soil that has the same size particles as an ungraded soil and a soil which has a wide range of particles within it as a well-graded soil. Now here we have a bed of model soil particles. They are all the same size, so this is a bed of ungraded soil particles. We want to measure the strength of this bed of soil, and we'll do that by loading a model foundation uh, and there it goes, it's uh, penetrating into 
uh, the bed of uniform particles and we will now measure how much it has penetrated with a simple ruler. Uh, and if we measure off to the baseline, we see that it is 22 millimeters. Now here we have a bed of well-graded soil. Uh, and you can see that the gaps between the large particles uh, are filled with the smaller particles. And we will put on two batteries as we did before. We can see it penetrating here. Now it's come to a standstill. So we'll measure how much it has penetrated. And we measure that it's penetrated 17 millimetres. Uh, whereas before, in the ungraded material, the footing has penetrated 22 millimetres. So in general, other things being equal, a well-graded material is stronger than an ungraded material. You won't be surprised to learn that the shape of the particles are very important in determining the strength of the soil. We've looked at the effect of grading on circular particles. Here we have replaced them by angular particles and for simplicity we've chosen triangular shaped particles. We will load it with the two batteries and measure the penetration. So here we see it settling and we'll measure what the penetration is. We see that the penetration is 12 millimetres, which is a lot less than for the circular particles. So the lesson from this demonstration is the more angular the soil particles, the stronger the soil. We've already seen that soil is a particulate material. And one of the really interesting features of particulate materials is the voids that are between the particles. Now, depending on where the soil is, it can be either filled with air or with water or a mixture of both. Now, in this video, I want to show you how important water pressure is in determining the behaviour of the soil. In my experience, major disasters can take place if the geotechnical engineer does not understand the importance of water pressure. For example, the Aberfan disaster in 1966, where water pressures were allowed to build up in a man-made soil on the hillside above the village of Aberfan. Eventually, the soil mass slid down the hillside as a slurry, killing 116 children and 28 adults. Now, in this demonstration, I want to show how important the water pressure is at the contact points between two particles. Now, I've got two particles here. You're going to have to bear with me. But one particle is this melanine board if you can imagine that. And the other particle is a beaker. And here it is. And this beaker is full of water. And we place this beaker full of water on that surface. And you'll see that it is stable. Shearing resistance between the cup and the board is great enough to stop the cup from sliding downwards. Now let's look at an identical beaker. Here we are. We place it on that slope and we'll fill it with water and we'll observe what happens. We'll see that that slides, we'll do it again. Now why is that? Why should one beaker be stable and the other not? And the answer is that this beaker has a hole in the bottom. Now the implications of that are that the water seeps through that hole and the head of water 
generates a pressure between the beaker and the wet surface. The pressure that builds up causes the force between the beaker and the surface to reduce. Now we know from the laws of physics that if you reduce the contact force between two frictional surfaces, you reduce the shearing resistance. And that is exactly what happens here. So we see from this demonstration how a build-up of water pressure between two particles can reduce the shearing resistance between those two particles. Many of you will have carried out experiments building sandcastles on beaches and you will understand some of the things that can happen to them under various conditions. We're going to build three sandcastles. The first one is using dry sand. And we see it forms a cone here. The next one is with damp sand. Now here's another one which is also from damp sand. But what happens when the tide comes in? So let's see what happens. You see this lovely stable sandcastle has just slumped. Now this effect and this effect we've covered already. Here we've just got the sand grains under their own weight acting frictionally. Here we've seen how water coming in below can reduce the forces between the particles, therefore reduce the shearing resistance and the sandcastle slumps. Why is this one so stable? And to understand that, we need to introduce a new concept, which is surface tension. Between each grain of sand, there is a little blob of water, uh, and the surface tension pulls the two grains together and generates forces between them. And that increases their shear strength. And that is why this performs so well. So in summary, we have seen that water pressure in the voids of a soil reduces its shear strength. Whereas in a damp soil, the surface tension in the water between the grains increases the forces between them and increases the shear strength.